But what, what needs to happen to uh, someone like Angela Merkel that she finally says, fuck it, like, uh, it's over? I don't think the kind this, of people, this, this the kind of people who ascend to um, that level of political power are people who have given up that kind of passion and vibrancy in their soul that would make them do that a long time ago. All right, Young and Naive, we're uh, back in Berlin. We're, we're back from our Europe trip, and um, I have a seemingly very naive guest. Can you, can you introduce yourself? I'm Glenn Greenwald, and um, I'm a journalist, and uh, I'm currently writing for The Intercept. And what else do you write? I heard you, you wrote a book or something. Yeah, yeah, I wrote a book about, there, you may have heard, I had a source who gave me some documents. Um, who was that? His name is Edward Snowden. Um, yeah, and uh, he gave me a bunch of documents, and so I wrote a book about the experience of reporting on the story about what the documents reveal, um, both putting the old stories into a broader context and reporting on some of the new ones, and then what the implications are, both in terms of um, the value of our privacy and the dangers of surveillance, as well as what the media reaction has been and, and some of the consequences for me personally from doing the reporting. So you're not a journalist who does human interest stories? Well, I mean, there is actually a pretty substantial human interest story, I think, to, to surveillance. Certainly, Edward Snowden, I think, is a really interesting human story. But I don't generally do, for example, celebrity profiles, if that's what you're asking. Too bad. Yeah, I'm thinking about trying to get into that, uh, but I haven't been able to yet. So uh, let's talk about your book. What, what is your, your book called again? It's called No Place to Hide. So who can't we uh, uh, hide from? Well, the title actually comes from uh, this Democratic senator named Frank Church, who in the 1970s led a Senate investigation into what the NSA was, because the joke in Washington for many years was that NSA stood for no such agency. Um, it wasn't just that people in Congress didn't know what it was doing, it's they literally didn't know that these capabilities even existed. And so when he finished his investigation, he gave an interview and he said that he was literally stunned by the capabilities that they had developed, that they could pull all forms of communication out of the air And he said the reason it was so dangerous is that if it ever is turned around on the American people, there'd be no way out of it. There'd be no place to hide. And, and so that's essentially what he warned about is exactly what has happened, which is that this capability has been turned around on the American people and the rest of the world in a way that is the kind of ubiquitous surveillance that he was, he was warning about. Is surveillance bad? I mean, not all surveillance is bad. Um, but when there's... What's your favorite kind of surveillance? What do you agree with? You know, I mean, I think that the United States government should probably be rereading the emails of, of Osama bin Laden um, when he was alive and, and his closest associates. I mean, I think that it's legitimate for states to spy on other states um, and engage in the standard traditional kinds of surveillance. But I think the key has to be that um, it isn't indiscriminate mass suspicionless surveillance where hundreds of millions of people or entire populations are put under a spying microscope that instead there should be a process by which the U.S. government or whoever, whichever government identifies the targets of surveillance, presents evidence to a court that the people they want to spy on or done something that warrant the surveillance and then have a real court make a decision about whether that spying ought to be permissible. So uh, there are people who are, who are spied on that didn't do anything, that haven't done anything. There are probably close to a billion people at least who are being spied on who have done nothing wrong. Um, if you consider having list of your communication activities, meaning who you're calling, who's calling you, who you're emailing, who's emailing you, collected and stored by the U.S. government and other agencies and being able to be accessed at any time, on top of which there are literally billions of telephone calls every month, billions, and email uh, exchanges that the NSA is collecting on top of the metadata, which is another form of mass surveillance. So why, why, why do you have to care about it? Uh, I mean, you, you say one billion people, maybe we're part of the five billion people that are not surveilled. Well, no, it, the reason it's only a billion is because of the number of people who use the Internet um, oh. and who don't use it versus those who don't use the Internet. So basically everybody who uses the Internet uh, is being surveilled? Well, the motto of the NSA is collect it all, um, not collect some or collect most of it, but collect it all. Um, and there's actually one document that adds to that motto in a really helpful way. It's collect it all, sniff it all, exploit it all, process it all, know it all. So Sounds there, like my mom. Yeah, I mean, interestingly, there is an analogy to sort of how all authorities function, which is parental authorities, religious authorities, school authorities always want to know as much as possible about the people over whom they want to exercise authority because the more you know about them, the more you can control and manipulate them. Um, and that really is the same dynamic.
So, uh, I mean, is this something new, though? I mean, uh, there's been God for 2,000 years. He probably has the same principles, collect it all, watch it all, uh, exploit it all. Is this something new? Uh, well, I mean, I guess... Uh, do we have a second God now in the NSA? Well, that's that's the, the goal, right, is, is this sort of omniscience. Um, and with omniscience comes omnipotence, which is the idea that especially... It isn't just that the U.S. government is knowing more and more about the people over whom they exercise their authority, but at the very same time, they are building an ever higher wall of secrecy behind which they can do pretty much everything without anyone knowing. And so it isn't just the surveillance aspect of it. It's this extreme information imbalance um, whereby almost everything they do occurs in a classified climate and everything we do is very transparent. And it's actually supposed to be the other way around. I mean, if you think about what a kind of healthy functioning democracy would look like. Um, people who exercise public authority and public power are supposed public, to be public transparent, official. Hence, hence the name, right, right. public, oh. um, except in very rare cases. Um, and private individuals, people who are not in, in public power, are supposed to have privacy, hence the name as well, except in the rarest of cases. And that's how you have a healthy functioning system, because that way the people over who are being ruled know what those in power are doing, but those in power don't know what they're doing. And this has been radically reversed, so that it's, it's, virtually it's, it's, everything vice, is... Vice versa. Now. Right, precisely. Um, almost 180 degrees. And that is the recipe for tyranny. That's just the standard model of tyranny, is that those in power know everything that their citizens are doing, but the citizens know nothing about what they're doing. So you say that there would be a healthy way of a democracy. Are we now an unhealthy democracy, or is it even a democracy? Well, this is really the question that I think is raised by this story more than just the surveillance and privacy issues, which is whatever else you think about the NSA or Edward Snowden or surveillance, the idea of constructing this collected all system that turns one of the most important human innovations in millennia, which is the internet, into the greatest means of human coercion and control ever known. That's an extremely significant thing to do. And the idea that huge populations ostensibly living in a democracy had no idea that it was being done, I don't mean the details of the program, I mean the broad contours of what was taking place, really does raise the question of how democratic these, these societies in which we live are. If you can have an election and have nobody even breathing a word about any of this because no one knows it's happening, how meaningful is this ritual where we go and select our leaders based on our outcome preferences? Um, I think any healthy democracy requires a baseline of transparency, and we're very far below that baseline. So we're not a democracy, like the, I mean, the Western society. You know, I mean, it depends what you mean by democracy. It's just one of those terms that that is vague and 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 susceptible to all kinds of disagreements. I mean, we do go to the polls once every four years, and the person who ends up moving into the government building um, is the person who gets the most votes. So there is something it's, it's symbolically seem, democratic about that. Always seems uh, like one of the two parties in your in your country. Well, that's because it is always one of the two parties. Um, that's why it seems that way. Um, and, you know, there's this there's this fascinating um, document that I don't know if you ever read, but if you haven't, you should go Probably read not. it. Um, no, you're pretty well read. I, I never read. I never read. Um, so, well, you should make an exception in this right, case. Right. Um, it's this 2008 CIA document that was written by analysts of the CIA. And what prompted it is that they were extremely concerned that there was this growing anti-war sentiment in Western Europe. I think the Dutch government, or one of the governments, I think it was the Dutch government, actually fell and were, was removed from office because of their support for the war in Afghanistan. The population had grown angry about this. And the CIA was really petrified that this anti-war sentiment would grow and would force Western European leaders to withdraw from Afghanistan and the war on terror more broadly and leave the United States alone to fight it. And they said the best hope for putting a stop to the spread of anti-war sentiment would be the election of Barack Obama. This is the summer of 2008. Because doing that would mean that the face of these wars was no longer this kind of swaggering, unilateralist cowboy that all of Western Europe hated. It would be this kind of kind, progressive, sophisticated, intellectual, much gentler face that Western Europeans loved. And it would mean that they would convert from anti-war opponents into pro-war activists. And it was really just a way of saying that who America elects is really just a brand that is designed to sell these policies to the world. The policies themselves are never going to change, just the packaging does. That's how the CIA saw the 2008 election, and I think it was pretty prescient. That happened not just in Western Europe and not just with war policies, but in the United States with a wide range of policies as well, where yeah, people I mean, just instantly converted. I mean, Jeremy Scale, uh, back in the day, uh, explained, like, the only difference between Obama and uh, Bush, at least uh, foreign-wise, is uh, Obama speaks English. 
Like he can he can talk in a more. Well, I mean, I think he's a much better salesperson for these policies, right? I mean, you want the world to see the emperor as a magnanimous and benevolent figure, somebody who you can trust and like because then you feel more comfortable with imperial policies. And the problem with George Bush was that he had ceased to become an effective salesperson, and they needed a kind of renovation of America's branding. And the, the most amazing fact to me is that Every year, the advertising industry gets together, kind of like the Academy Awards. It's like the Academy Awards of the advertising industry. And they give awards to the best branding campaign, the best marketing campaign. And in 2008, they gave their top award for branding to the Obama campaign. That's how adept and skillful that was. And they recognized it for what it was, even though Western Europeans thought the whole thing was real, um, as did a lot of Americans. So whose product is he? Like, whose product is Barack Obama? Well, I mean, the there are permanent factions in Washington that get their way regardless of the outcome of elections. And I know this sounds like a radical observation to some people. Like, like lobby groups or something? Like politicians? Like Wall Street, like corporate factions, like the national security state and the public and private um, factions that comp compose it. I mean, if you go back 60 years to Dwight Eisenhower's farewell address. You know, Dwight Eisenhower was a four-star general. He led the U.S. to victory in World War II, and then he became a Republican president for eight years. And on the last day, when he was leaving office, he got the opportunity to speak to the country for eight minutes and wanted to impart the most important lesson that he had learned. And he warned of what we now know or think about as what he called the military-industrial complex and said there's this union of military agencies and private corporations um, that has upgrade. become, yes, well, right, and it was, that was the precursor. Um, but it was this kind of union, and it, he said it was becoming so powerful that it was actually becoming more powerful than even the most powerful democratically elected official, which was the president. He was obviously speaking from experience and saying they pose a serious threat to democracy. And this was, you know, 50 years ago, um, and it has gotten radically worse since then. It was before the Vietnam War, before 9-11, before the height of the Cold War. So America has just dramatically expanded it beyond what it was even then. And that's the kind of, I mean, it's almost impossible for a president to challenge those factions, even if they were committed to doing so. And, and Obama never tried. And, and so it was never even a, a question about whether or not they would continue to reign supreme in, in his presidency they have. So wh wh why doesn't he try? I mean, he's a popular guy. Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, I mean, it, it's very difficult to divine other people's motives, right? Like, why doesn't Obama do more against these policies? I mean, I think we all have a hard time divining our own motives, let alone other people's. But at some point, you know, I know it's really comforting, especially for people who, who supported Obama initially, to believe that deep in his heart, he really finds these policies objectionable and he wishes so much that he didn't get have to get forced into doing them, but there's just nothing he can do. I mean, this is a very kind of self-satisfying explanation. It gives him, I think, way too much credit. I mean, he hasn't been in office for five weeks or five months. He's been in office for five years. And, you know, at some point you have to conclude that he supports these policies because he supports them. But, but, but he says, well, I'm, I'm critical of them. Well, I mean, saying that he was critical of them was something he needed to do to win the election and to gain power. And the idea that people say things they don't really believe to gain power should not really surprise us, um, given that that's more or less the whole history of, of politics since it began, you know, back back in um, sort of the early post caveman days. Um, so, but so, no, so, I, I think I, I mean, I think that, you know, he, he what happens is that when you're out of power, It's easy to criticize policies that vest power in people because those people who have the power are people that you think are bad. But once you yourself then ascend to power, um, the idea that this power is bad doesn't occur to you anymore because you believe that you're such a good person that you can be trusted with that power and you can use it for good ends. And in fact, you start to think that the more power you have, the better because you're a good person and the more powerful good people like Barack Obama are, the better it is for the world. Uh, it's, 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 people always say the most powerful man in the world is the U.S. president. Is he really the most powerful person in the world? I mean, it depends on what you mean by power. I mean, that's a really, that, I mean, that's a hard question to answer, but... What's power? No, I mean, in general, there are enormous amounts of constraints on what the president can do. Um, I mean, John F. Kennedy, um, you know, sort of famously tried to change a few policies that had been sort of long-standing, and that was the reason why people to this day theorize that he was killed. Um, I don't know if I believe that, but, you know, you can debate that, but I think that the, the lesson there is real, which is that 
you know, it isn't that someone is the commander in chief and can just start wars or end wars or end policies or shift program uh, spending priorities um, and not be have pushback against them. They're extremely powerful um, entities in the United States that that severely limit and even dictate what he can and can't do. Is that dangerous or is it a good thing? I mean, it can be bold. It depends on, on, I mean, the idea is supposed to be that the, the president and everybody else has checks against him. So, you know, there's supposed to be a, an adversarial media that is a check on him. He's supposed to have a Congress that struggles for power. He's supposed to have a court that imposes constitutional limits. Those are good kinds of checks limiting what he can do. Unfortunately, those have all failed. Really? And then, yeah, I know that's breaking news on, on your show, but yeah. Um, yeah, they have. And then, you know, the ultimate check is supposed to be ordinary citizens being able to through their voting and through their activism and their other political rights guaranteed by the Constitution, limit what he can do, he can do as well. But because of a whole variety of reasons like extreme income inequality and the sort of suffocating closeness of the two parties, that check has failed too. And so really one of the only checks on the president um, are what a very small but powerful sliver of, of people inside the United States, people who wield political and economic power, want him to do or, or not do. So I think in general it's good that he has checks, but these specific checks are, are not particularly healthy. So he's not really an emperor. Like you, you, you mentioned uh, American empire. Uh, is he the least powerful emperor uh, in history? I mean, I, I don't, you know, not every Roman emperor was um, omnipotent. I mean, they were all constrained by by different factions to some degree. Um, by, you know, political leaders have always been beholden to high economic interest because political power needs economic backing in order to maintain its power. Um, so no, very few leaders in history have really had ex absolute supremacy. Um, so, you know, I think an emperor is more just the symbolic head of an empire, the, the person that the empire puts forth in the world as the leader. And sometimes they really are the leader and sometimes they're nominal um, symbols. And and I think in Obama's case, he's, he's clearly more the latter than the former. So does the empire still exist or is it uh, almost collapsing or something? It's definitely a declining empire. Um, I mean, if you look at what Osama bin Laden said that he hoped to achieve from the 9-11 attacks, it was that the U.S. would overreact to the extent that it would overextend itself and essentially cause itself to collapse on itself. Um, and I think to a large degree that that vision has been vindicated or, or fulfilled. I think that's exactly what the U.S. has done. He's like a Hannibal. I mean, he was at least uh, 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 he was at least pretty prescient about how to harm the U.S. strategically. Um, you know, he knew he couldn't defeat the U.S. militarily, so he just kind of lured them into doing really self-destructive things. Um, and then on top of that, um, the economic crisis of 2008 has put the U.S. on extremely dubious economic footing, where extreme social inequality is weakening all of the institutions that have always sort of driven America, causing almost inevitable social instability at some point in the near future, and, and otherwise making America much much weaker in the world. But, but if the empire is collapsing why, why why do they still have the biggest military budget why are they uh, dominating uh, land air sea space cyberspace uh, for well for, that I mean, doesn't sound well, like a declining empire well i mean declining doesn't mean collapsed it means in the process of becoming weaker um but you know i think also that it's exactly what we were just talking about before i mean look who the people are who benefit from those policies when you spend enormous amounts of money buying very advanced weapons technology or surveillance technology from large corporations there's a certain sliver of the population namely the ones that we were just talking about that dictate government policy the military that industrial benefit, complex. right and that benefit greatly at the expense of everybody else and so they have no interest in having those policies end they have every interest in having them continue even though they're so patently self-destructive when you look at the interest of the country itself meaning the people of the country so uh, do they have an interest that uh, you and edward um made public what uh, what what they what they're doing like what do they care that this it's now known the surveillance Sure, I think they do care. Um, they care in part because it actually, I mean, one of the best pressure points um, is the fact that American tech companies are now truly petrified that the exposed surveillance system is going to seriously harm their future economic prospects. Obviously, Facebook and Google and Yahoo, with very little exception, didn't give a shit at all about the invasion of their users' privacy when they could do it without a cost, meaning when it was done completely in secret. But now that it's been revealed, they're extremely worried that German companies and Brazilian companies and Asian companies are going to be able to tell 10-year-olds and 8-year-olds 
and 16 year olds don't give your data to Facebook and, and Google and other American companies because they'll give it to the NSA, use our service instead. And um, so I think that these revelations have harmed um, Silicon Valley. They've harmed economic elites. Um, people are, I think, going to think twice and three times and four times about whether they should buy American technological products. It's harmed important alliances and relationships that business uses around the world dip diplomatically through the U.S. government, like Germany and, and Brazil. Um, and it's also sort of undermined faith of Americans and other people around the world in the American government and in its trustworthiness and the role that it plays in the world. So I think it has been fairly damaging to the interest of those tiny slivers of elites who usually get their way. But, but, but this kind of make, 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 makes me wonder why um, the German public or German media, lately at least, uh, has shifted the blame from uh, the United States government, the German government, to like Google. Why, why, why are they attacking Google and not uh, the? Well, I mean, I don't Empire. see I don't see them as mutually exclusive. Like sometimes people ask, you know, well, why are you spending all your time reporting on the NSA? What about all the tech companies? Um, you know, and for one thing, I mean, as a journalist, you, if somebody gives you tens of thousands of top secret documents, that is the first ever leak from the NSA, you're just going to spend a good amount of time reporting on the NSA. That's just sort of a natural thing to do. Um, but, you know, these documents have revealed a fair amount of close cooperation between these companies and the NSA that we have been able to report. Um, but, you know, it is true that that corporate surveillance and corporate spying is its own serious problem. The idea that these corporations maintain huge troves of data about us with very little accountability um, but I think there's a big difference between having Google be able to collect the activities that you do through Google because they're only collecting that. They're not collecting emails that you send through Yahoo or chats that you have on Facebook or calls that you do on Skype versus having the United States government in a centralized way, in their words, collect it all. I think the latter is much more threatening, even though they're both extremely disturbing. So how can we as Germans um, tell your empire, maybe stop doing that? Well, I mean, Germany happens to be a pretty influential and powerful country in the world. The United States needs Germany in, in all kinds of ways. Um, and even more important, if Germany creates coalitions and alliances with other countries, as they've been doing, for example, with Brazil, which is also an important country to the United States in all sorts of ways and becoming increasingly powerful, the cost to the United States of having and maintaining and growing the surveillance state can get so high that it's no longer considered in their interest to do. You can also reconfigure the internet physically so that so much infrastructure no longer has to transit um, U.S. soil, which is a big reason why the U.S. can maintain information dominance. Um, and you can also, governments can also work on technologies, unlike the NSA, which works to destroy privacy, to strengthen privacy. Governments could devote money to creating better encryption technologies to prevent, to prevent other agencies from invading the communications of and, and of their citizens and of their companies. But, I mean, I mean, if you look at the last year, uh, all that happened is, or seemingly, is that uh, our grand coalition uh, wants to do what the NSA does. Like they, they want, they want the BND to be able to do what, what the NSA. Can. I mean, I think, I mean, I think that there is a clear recognition, even on the parts of governments. Um, that allowing the U.S. ongoing hegemony over the Internet is not in their interest. Um, I think there's an emotional component to it because a lot of these leaders feel as though they personally have been invaded, which I think is a good thing. It makes them empathize more with the people who, just ordinary people who are under a surveillance microscope, that they're not exempt. Um, but I also do think that they don't just think that if they replicate the surveillance capabilities that that will solve the problem because the U.S. is so far ahead right now of what any other country is capable of doing and is devoting so many more resources. I mean, there are 80,000 people working at the NSA in both a public and a private capacity, no other country is even close to devoting those levels of resources to surveillance and it won't do that for a long time. So I think that the combination of technological pressure, other governments banding together, and most importantly of all, individuals starting to take matters into their own hand and, and building brick walls around their communication in the forms of encryption um, can put a serious dent in what the NSA is capable of doing. But what, what needs to happen to uh, someone like Angela Merkel that she finally says, Fuck it, like uh, it's over. I don't think the kind it, of people, it's, it's the kind of people who ascend to um, that level of political power, are people who have given up that kind of passion and vibrancy in their soul that would make them do that a long time ago. So they have no um, soul. They don't act on principle. They they have if they have a soul, it's like 
kind of very decrepit and barely hanging on. It's like kind of like when your car is on empty in your gas tank and it's just sort of sputtering along. You're not completely out of gas. Um, but, you know, for all intents and purposes, I mean, you just are in a very diminished state of, of, of ability. And sure. I think that's how most they make so many compromises along the way to ascend that ladder of political power um, that I think their soul, to the extent that it existed, had been suffocated. So I think it's just a very pragmatic calculation. The U.S. and Germany have all kinds of important relationships beyond surveillance. Um, um, that Germany probably isn't willing to blow up on principle. Is Angela Merkel maybe afraid uh, of what um, the NSA or um, Secret Service has on her? I think in the back of her mind that has to be the case. Um, you know, I think uh, one of the reasons in Brazil that this story resonated so much is because once there was a revelation about the president of Brazil, Dilma Rousseff, being personally targeted in her email communications, the Brazilian government became genuinely indignant as opposed to pretending to be angry, which is what they were when they thought it was just hundreds of millions of ordinary Brazilians. And Not one of us. one of the right as long as it wasn't us. And one of the reasons for that is because you know there's a lot of speculation that that she's gay, that she I mean that's sort of like an open secret. And so the the sense of invasiveness that comes from knowing that you're personally being targeted. I mean I know for myself you know from the beginning of the story I've been assuming abstractly that I'm probably the target of surveillance. But once the British government filed papers in the lawsuit brought by my partner alleging that his detention at Heathrow was illegal and it confirmed that they were really were reading our emails and listening to our telephone calls, some combination of him and me and the Guardian, the, the visceral invas uh, invasion that you feel, even though you probably assume that you're actually already being surveilled, is very intense and very visceral. It's very, it's very real. And I think that's what a lot of these leaders have experienced, even though they might have known in the abstract. And that has actually shaped the reaction in a pretty positive way. Oh, and uh, what about Obama himself? Maybe the NSA has collected uh, some information about a young senator before he became president. Right. I mean, that's all possible. And, you know, when you asked before, like, why does surveillance matter? I think this is exactly Exactly the reason is that when we have a world in which it's not necessarily the case, but possibly the case that we can be watched at any moment, the level of the amount of choices that we have as human beings diminishes greatly. It automatically creates a climate of fear where we feel like we're being watched and judged and monitored. And there's all kinds of social science that I talk about in the book and all sorts of experiments and other things where what that means is that you tend to be much more conformist in your behavior, much more sort of... Um, You, you comply a lot more with societal dictates about how you're supposed to behave. It really destroys a huge part of human freedom. But what it also does is makes people very petrified that in those moments when they do deviate from what society thinks is normal or right, that that information can be used against them. And if you read, you know, 1984, which is sort of the cliche of an ultimate surveillance state, there's a passage in there that explicitly says that the monitors that are placed in homes are not necessarily surveilling every citizen at every moment. In fact, the citizens, to the citizens, it's possible that they're never being surveilled. What matters is the capability that this system has to watch them at any time, which means they have to always assume that they're being watched and then act accordingly. And that really is the danger of surveillance on, an, on a sort of collective level, but also even for powerful politicians um, who might be worried that some of their incriminating information has been collected and, had, and can be used against them. But, but, I mean, what does this surveillance do? I mean, now we know that uh, we're being surveilled uh, on a digital level almost totally. Uh, I mean, I remember my parents. So they're from East Germany. Uh, they grew up with the Stasi. Uh, back then, they didn't have a choice. Okay, do we want the Stasi or not? It was a totalitarian system. Uh, do we now still have a choice uh, to, uh, to not have this effect on society, or is it too late? Well, no, I mean, if I thought it was too late, I probably wouldn't have spent the last year of my life working on it. I mean, I do that because, and I think Edward Snowden wouldn't have come forward. I mean, once people have the knowledge that other human beings are doing certain things that they don't like, there's always the capability to prevent that from happening. Um, and, you know, as I said before, to me, the thing that makes me most optimistic about the possibility to put an end to surveillance is that the surveillance state is a technological attack. And like all technological attacks in, can be defended against through technological means. And there are already serious encryption programs that are available and that exist and that I use and lots of other people use that the NSA gen genuinely cannot penetrate. Like what? 
Spike PGP email or uh, the Tor browser, which is fundamentally solid, um, or certain encrypted chat programs like OTR and Pigeon, um, none of which is completely perfect, um, but which give a very, very high degree of, of assurance that you can communicate privately. And what's going to happen is that as people become more acutely aware of their privacy being violated and as companies start to create better products that are more user friendly, encryption will become the default means by which we all communicate. Um, and once that starts to happen, that will put a very serious obstacle in the way of the NSA and the GCHQ and other agencies to monitor everything that we're doing. So is encryption the only way out of this, um, this mess? I don't think it's the only way. I mean, like I said before, I think that there are lots of pressure points. Um, I think other com other countries um, can think about how to create alternative infrastructure that, that undermines the U.S. ability to do this. I think uh, tech companies are have become serious, not because they care at all about privacy, of course they don't, but because they care about their own self-interest um, to demand that there be some limit. So I think there's multiple pressure points being applied to what the NSA is doing and that can, in a cumulative sense, become effective. So, I mean, what I was wondering... Do we just have a few more minutes? Is yeah, that we do. We, no, we, we, we're like, Okay. At least another 10 minutes. Okay. So go ahead. Oh, no, you go ahead. Oh, uh, what I was always wondering, I mean, they, they, they've been collecting all this data, all this metadata and all that. What are they actually doing with it? I mean, they, they, they can't uh, analyze everything, right? Are they storing it for later uh, just in case or something? Well, I mean, there, there's already reporting that demonstrates that they use this system for just classic abuse cases, uh, abusive uh, purposes. So there's a document that we published a few months ago in which they have identified six what they call radicalizers, meaning people who express ideas that the U.S. government considers radical, um, who the document says... Don't you have a free speech? I mean, isn't that what, what free speech is about? Uh, ex tolerating and accepting... Uh, the right, theoretically, yeah, yeah, that's supposed to be what it's about. So, But the U.S. government has identified these, these people who are radicals and... What, and have collected um, their most intimate sexual chats that they have online, um, the logs of the pornographic websites that they visited, wow. and the document explicitly talks about how that information can be released in order to destroy the reputation of, of these individuals and undermine and discredit their ability to proselytize this message. Um, there's GCHQ documents monitoring the visits of people to WikiLeaks website to monitor who it is who, who goes and reads those documents, or ways to target hacktivists, um, people who are associated with Anonymous to destroy their reputation using fake blog posts, um, claiming to be victims of these individuals by just lying and making things up about what they did, or honey traps to lure people into compromising positions using what appear on the internet to be attractive women who will make them do things that, that can undermine their reputation. Wow. So it's exactly the kind of, of sort of abuse that we've already reported um, that led to scandalous surveillance uh, controversies of the past, and there's a lot more reporting that we're working on now about that, about how they use this surveillance. So, I mean, um, my mom, back to my mom and grandma, uh, they still don't care about all this. How can I make them care? Well, I mean, look, there's always going to be a portion of the population that is indifferent to political abuses. I mean, if you go and look at the worst tyrannies in the world, not every single Egyptian was out on the street marching in favor of democracy and trying to remove Mubarak from office. There's always a bargain that you as a individual can make with even the most abusive forms of power. There's always a bargain that people who abuse their power offer, which is if you pose no threat to us and don't challenge us in any way, you just go about your lives, pay no attention to what we're doing, don't express any views about it, don't work against us in any way, we will leave you alone. And there are huge numbers of people who will accept that bargain and will say, not just I don't care about surveillance, but if tomorrow there were some military coup in Germany um, or in some other country um, and some obvious dictator emerged and said, I'm declare myself president for life, there would be huge numbers of people who would say, that doesn't really bother me. I think that the stability that we're going to have is a good thing. Um, you can't insist that every single person um, be engaged in these kinds of political controversies and that if large numbers of people don't want to be, that's proof that somehow the story isn't taking hold. That's just the nature of how human beings are willing to bargain away their liberties. And there's probably nothing to do about that because what's being offered is something very valuable, which is security. We will protect you and leave you alone um, as long as you submit and acquiesce to what we're doing. And there will always be lots of people who want to accept that bargain. So you said the government is glad when people don't care. Uh, 
shouldn't the government like thinking as the government shouldn't they uh, want that even more people don't care about things like isn't it is it a good for power that even less and less people care about everyday politics yeah i mean that's why you know the idea of politics is just to sort of numb people to what it is that's taking place i mean if you look at the public discussion of politics it bears almost no relationship to what people in power are actually doing they don't want there to be any interest in or knowledge about or discussion of the things that they're actually doing. They want to make politics as sort of trivial and petty and removed from what matters most to people because they want people sitting on their couch watching things that have nothing to do with what they're doing. That's in their interest and they work very hard to make that happen. So, and the uh, final question, I mean, I heard you, you, you're, you're pretty good in the constitution wise, like you're a constitutional lawyer or something? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, wasn't Obama that too? He was, he was. That's something he and I share. So, I mean, what, what, what's the difference between you and Obama? B besides being him, him in power and you having journalistic power. Well, I mean, that's a pretty significant difference, I think. I mean, I do think power is actually quite corrupting. I mean, that's not my observation. That's something that's been known by sociologists and political theorists and, and um, psychologists for, for many centuries. Um, and so it's so what we were talking so, about before. So he's like a Sith Lord now? Like a, you, well, I mean, you know, if, Star if, Wars? If, you, if you look at Obama's memoirs um, that he wrote before he became president. I don't read. Yeah, I know. So that's why I'm going to summarize them for you. Um, I've learned that during this interview that that's necessary. Um, he is very clear about the fact that the key kind of tactic that he has always used to advance himself in life has been to always avoid alarming people who wield power, alarming institutional authorities. Part of that is, is, is as he put it, you know, the idea of growing up African-American in a, in a society that has the history of, of racial injustices that the U.S. does, that he describes it as kind of no quick movements. The idea that you should never be kind of alarming or, or too aggressive in, in undermining institutional authority. And I think that along the way that morphed into what actually matters is accommodating institutional authority. That's how you advance yourself. And that's certainly become his principal tactic um, in order to, to empower himself. And I'm sure he justifies it to himself by saying that those are necessary compromises in order to then do the good things that he wants to do. But what actually ends up happening is it becomes its own end. It becomes a justification in itself and power becomes the end in itself. And once you go down that path, I think you lose all of the things that originally animated you to want to seek those things out in the first place. And I think that's more than anything what what has happened to him. And I don't think it's a recent development. I think it happened quite a long time ago. What's your principal tactic? I mean, I, I think that, you know, one of the things that I'm very intent on doing is no matter how much visibility the story gets, no matter how much sort of temptation there is to enter these formerly impenetrable clubs, um, that I just remain as much of an outsider as possible and that I, you know, continue to make sure that my work is about subverting and undermining institutional authority and not um, sort of ending up even indirectly supporting it in exchange for its lavishing rewards on me. I mean, that's a very, that's the typical formula that's used for co-option, and it's one that I think you have to very aggressively guard against in order to sort of continue to stay true to your principles. I mean, there are always two people like who don't get into a club, those who cannot get into uh, the club of the insiders and those who want to get in, but uh, no, who don't want to get in and say, well... Uh, who are offered it and, and don't, yeah. and, and I so hope to remain very firmly in that second group. Okay. What? Well, because I, I think that, I mean, I began writing about politics because I thought that these institutions were fundamentally corrupted. And I still think they're fundamentally corrupted. And I'd much rather be standing outside of them, throwing rocks at them, than being inside, being comfortably ensconced in one of their their, their um, really lovely lounge chairs. And the temptation to be invited in and the rewards that go with it are very serious. They're very potent. That's why they can be really corrupting. And, and once you do that, you lose everything that originally drove you to want to do this work in the first place. Um, and you may get material benefits from it and greater comfort, uh, but you lose everything else that's, that's much more significant and much more important. And I mean, if I ever reached the point where I actually thought that I had made that trade off, the way that that would rest on my conscience would be so much worse than anything else that could happen that no amount of benefit or reward is worth that. So let's say, I mean, the New York Times needs a new editor in chief. What if the New York Times comes to you and says, do you want to be our boss? Would you would you take that opportunity? 
Well, I mean, the, the, the reality is, the ed, as we just saw, the editor-in-chief of the New York Times is not actually the boss. The boss of the New York Times is the Sulzberger family, which owns the New York Times. And the editor-in-chief has to serve the journalistic agenda and the journalistic preferences of that family or else she will be fired as as the last editor-in-chief just was. And so, you know, for me, the question always is, um, in whatever you're being offered, can you maintain the same sense of autonomy and independence um, that you've always demanded in the past? Is that really a genuine guarantee? And if it's not, then no job or no opportunity is worth accepting because sacrificing that even a little bit puts you down on that road where now you believe that that trade-off has become a, a rational one to make. And that's what turns you into Angela Merkel or Barack Obama. So the editor in chief of the New York Times um, has to write what the owner of the New York Times likes. Not, not has to write specifically. She doesn't get daily memos, but she has to manage the institution in a way that serves his interest and, and accommodates his preferences. Okay. So I mean, in the end, uh, I, I already um, introduced you to the idea of crowd report. I don't know if you heard of it. Uh, it's like the maybe the German version of. Uh, of um, the intercept maybe without a billionaire we went we tried to get the money via crowdfunding uh But but just to be clear, if you if a billionaire magically emerged and said, I'm very enamored by this model that you've created and I would like to fund you and guarantee your independence, you would accept that funding, right? Right. If he accepted that he has uh, as much to say as the guy who, who gave us 10 euro. Right, right, precisely. You would then accept that funding. Sure. Right. Okay, just, just checking. Uh, what, what do you think of reader-funded journalism? Is that, a, is that a good thing or do you find this dangerous as well? No, I love reader-funded journalism. And in fact, the one the way that I was able to make a living for the first three years or four years uh, in, in writing about politics when I had nothing but my own blog and then moved my blog to Salon at the very beginning was through reader-funded journalism, through people who believed that the journalism that I was doing was unique and valuable and should be supported. And once a year, I had a sort of fundraising week um, and was able to sustain myself. And I think the reason why it was so... Um, sort of encouraging and positive is because what it means is that you're accountable to nobody other than to your readers, um, which is a good thing to be. Um, really? Yeah, because, Why? well, I mean, I think, you know, it, that can have its own dangers too, in the sense that you then start feeling like you have to feed your readers what they want and avoid ever doing or saying anything that they don't agree with. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the strings that come with funding apply just as much to being funded by a large corporation or a billionaire as they do to just crowdsourcing um, because you have to continue to remain popular with the crowd if you want that funding to continue and that too can be its own corrupting force and just as you have to insist upon your independence from large corporations that fund you so too do you have to insist upon your integrity and your intellectual honesty even though crowds are funding you right. you have to be willing to alienate them when the situation calls for it but in general i think crowdfunding is a a, a really great model the problem with it is that and this is one of the things i learned over the last year is that if you want to do really sustained, profound investigative journalism that checks the most powerful corporate and political institutions, you need not just the money that lets you kind of make a living, you need very serious resources to be able to be on par with those institutions against whom you're trying to work. You need editors and fact checkers and other reporters and technologists we have those. We have and those. technologies yeah. um, and travel budgets. Um, we don't have those? You know, so, I mean, and, and oftentimes you need lawyers. I mean, one of the problems with American media is that because so many of these institutions are struggling financially, they are petrified of ending up in lawsuits with big corporations or ending up being prosecuted or otherwise in legal battles with the state. And so that makes their reporting very risk adverse because they don't want to ever, so you, they constantly have lawyers hovering over the journalists to right. keep these institutions out of any legal battles, right. which produces a serious climate of fear. So, you know, the legal fees alone from the reporting I've done in the last year, I don't know exactly what the amount is, but it definitely exceeds, I mean, it's definitely in the millions of dollars. Um, and had I been by myself wow. or with a couple of people, that would have posed a really serious problem. Same with having to secure these technologies or hire outside experts or um, being able to travel or have people travel to me. Um, and so one of the reasons that shaped, one of the factors that shaped my decision to, to sort of create our new, own news organization but find a way to fund it in a meaningful way was my experience of the last year and the recognition that if you really want to be fearless in the journalism you're doing, you need not only those resources, but you need to know that you have somebody behind you um, or money behind you um, that can protect you in the event that you do have those fights. You don't want to, in the back of your mind, be afraid of, of engaging those fights because of the knowledge that you can't afford it. So we better get two billionaires.
Yeah, I'll, you can, I, I would recommend that. But what, what, what do you think of the of the structure of a, of a, of a newsroom? Like, we don't have like a, a boss that tells us, okay, maybe you can pursue this story or this story. It's more like a horizontal model. Uh, Jeremy Scale talked about it, about your model. It's, it's kind of similar. Why, 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 why is this kind of journalistic model um, maybe a good thing or a model of the future? I mean, I think that one of the things that has happened to journalism that is a really destructive force is that it has become corporatized. And what happened, meaning large corporations own the biggest media outlets and then impose a corporate ethos on those media outlets. And a corporate ethos tends to be there's a very rigid hierarchy where one person reports to another who reports to another who reports to another. And to make sure that the structure is accountable to the person at the top so the whole institution works in accordance with their agenda. And what that means is that journalists are now just corporate employees. And corporate employees are trained to avoid controversy. They're trained to avoid alienating powerful people. They're trained not to question but to sort of serve authority and it has drained journalism of all of its passion and vibrancy because journalists are constantly told you can't have your own individual voice you can't be animated and passionate you can't really be a human being you've got to confine yourself to this model of how we think about the world and how we what we can say and what we can't say and I think it's made journalism not only weak and impotent but actually boring and that's why so many people are turning to alternative sources so hey, this kind of um, horizontal model that tells journalists you know, you're going to work with other people because that makes the journalism better. If you have somebody saying you don't quite have this fact yet and, and I just fact check this and you're wrong about this, you want to have collaborators, people that you work with. But what you don't want is to have a kind of model of how you speak and think about the world imposed from the top on you. Um, it just it drains journalism of all of its vibrancy and passion. Um, and so I think this horizontal model is a crucial attribute of new media, the thing that makes it interesting and dynamic and powerful. So we're saying online journalism is broken. You say it's just boring. I mean, by, I, I think what's boring is, is sort of the old media model, these large corporate um, entities that own media outlets. Um, you know, I do think some new media is boring too because a lot of new media is really nothing more than just copying what old media does but just doing it online. There's nothing innovative about it. There's nothing passionate about it. It really isn't all that interesting. Um, I think what makes journalism ultimately interesting is maximizing the parts of human beings that are interesting. And I think a lot of media outlets are trying to suffocate and kill those parts. Um, and to me, that's one of the critical distinctions. Well, thank, you. thank you very much. Glenn, uh, I, didn't, I don't know if you notice we are at the Holocaust Monument in front of your homeland. Two extremely inspiring buildings, the Holocaust Monument and the American Consulate How was in that? Berlin. How was that? It's just, um, it was, I had a very hard time concentrating with all the inspiration swirling around me. What's the purpose? Well, you, you succeeded. Thank you very much. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.